Bray Wyatt may very well be the most creative wrestler of his era. As a third generation performer, Wyatt has a natural feel for the business and everything that goes along with it. Yes, Wyatt has mastered that art of modern day storytelling with his ability to evolve as a character and keep us fans wanting more. And during an era where WWE has been forced to rethink how it puts on matches, his use of cinematics has seen him rise to the very top. But what about the man behind the gimmick? Well, his story has been nothing less than fascinating. So join us today as we take a deep dive into his entire career journey so far in Let Him In, The Bray Wyatt Story. Wyndham Lawrence Rotunda was born on May 23, 1987 in Brooksville, Florida, and it was there he would become steeped in the wrestling world from a very early age as not just his father, but his grandfather and his two uncles were all prominent figures in the industry. His dad was, of course, Mike Rotunda, famous to most fans for his run with WWE as IRS, while his uncles were NWA stalwarts Barry and Kendall Wyndham, and his grandfather was legendary figure Blackjack Mulligan. With all these industry heavyweights in his family then, it seemed obvious that Wyndham and his younger brother Taylor would be getting involved themselves before too long. The former's path towards this started in high school, where he got into amateur wrestling and even managed to win a state championship in 2005. From there, he had a brief dalliance with football, but it was only brief because the world of his family was already calling. And so, on February 5th, 2009, he was able to use his connections and his amateur skills to bag himself a spot in Florida Championship Wrestling, WWE's developmental territory at the time. This was where he would start training. His first opportunity to actually wrestle for FCW came a little later than that on February 9th, 2009, when he defeated Brian Jossie in a dark match. A couple of months later, and he made his televised debut, performing under the names of Alex Rotundo and then later Duke Rotundo. Those early days saw him experiment with a number of different things. Wyndham flirted with tag team wrestling for a while before he teamed up with his brother, who was by then going by the name of Bo Dallas to become the FCW Tag Team Champions. After this, he created a new gimmick for himself in the form of Husky Harris and began performing on NXT when it was still in its early game show format. While this version of NXT isn't the most well-remembered by fans, it did give us the Nexus, who would end up being Harris's first ticket up to the main roster. The Nexus, of course, were a collective of NXT Season 1 contestants who had banded together and invaded the main roster. Initially, they included the likes of Wade Barrett, Ryback, Heath Slater, and Daniel Bryan, and for a brief period, were the hottest thing in the industry. Unfortunately, though, by the time Harris joined the faction in October 2010, the glory days were already over, and the Nexus were becoming more and more of an afterthought. During this period, he would get some TV time, mostly by teaming with Michael McGillicuddy, but it was clear that this wasn't going to be the big breakthrough that he was hoping for. Realizing this, the company sent him back down to FCW in 2011, where he quickly got to work on reinventing himself. Rotunda had been a big horror buff for his whole life, and so he immediately began thinking about different horror villain-style characters he could play. His first attempt at this was the hockey mask wearing Axel Mulligan, who made a few appearances at live events but never got as far as television. It didn't matter though, he had a million other ideas in the tank, and each one seemed to be better than the last. In fact, it would be his next one that turned him into a superstar. Yes, in April 2012, Rotunda introduced the world to Bray Wyatt for the first time. Wyatt was portrayed as a Bayou cult leader, modeled heavily on Cape Fear villain Max Cady and previous WWE performer Waylon Mercy. But while his inspirations were clear, Bray took things to the next level by completely immersing himself in the character, often speaking in long, sprawling monologues and recruiting various minions to his cause. By 2013, when FCW was folded into the newly rebranded NXT, the Wyatt family moved with them and became arguably the best thing about the early days of the black and gold brand. During this time, the buzz around the Wyatt family grew and grew until main roster fans even began to take notice and calls for them to be moved up became commonplace. Yes, in an era where there was increased focus on strong in-ring work and real-life characters such as the likes of CM Punk and Daniel Bryan, fans saw something unique in the highly character-based gimmick. It was like something plucked straight out of the Hulkamania era, adapted just enough so it didn't feel out of place in the modern product. When the company started airing vignettes on May 27, 2013 then, hinting that the Wyatts were finally coming, audience excitement reached a fever pitch. 
And they wouldn't have to wait much longer, as it turned out, because on the July 8th episode of Raw, Bray and his underlings finally made their main roster debut, attacking Kane and setting themselves up for a subsequent feud with the Big Red Machine. This feud would climax at SummerSlam on August 18th, where Wyatt had his first pay-per-view bout under the gimmick, taking on Kane in a Ring of Fire match. Following this, the Wyatt family continued their run of dominance, and soon set about trying to make their biggest conquest yet when they went after Daniel Bryan, beating him up in a 3-on-1 handicap match at that December's Tables, Ladders, and Chairs, and even briefly managing to recruit him to the group. By this point, Bray had gotten so over that readers of Dave Meltzer's Wrestling Observer Newsletter voted him the best gimmick of 2013, and many saw 2014 as being the year where he would finally break out into the main event scene. And this was certainly how it looked like it was going to play out as the year began. He had an excellent match with Bryan at the January 26th Royal Rumble, and then entered into a feud with John Cena leading up to WrestleMania 30. Of course, a match against the face of the company at the biggest show of the year was an undeniable show of confidence in the eldest rotunda brother, and his popularity grew so much during the build to it that some fans even started to cheer for him. It became a common sight, in fact, to see audiences hold up the lights of their phones whenever Wyatt came out to the ring, signifying that they were indeed following the buzzards and turning to his side. The momentum was built upon even more when the month before WrestleMania, the Wyatt family had a dream match showdown with The Shield at the February 23rd Elimination Chamber pay-per-view, a match which you could make a solid argument was the best of that year. All that had to happen now was for Bray to get the big win and skyrocket to superstardom, and WrestleMania 30 was the night for it. On that night, of course, Daniel Bryan beat three members of Evolution to become the WWE Champion, while The Shield destroyed Attitude Era stalwarts Kane and the New Age Outlaws. As well as this, Cesaro looked like he was finally about to break through after winning the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal, and The Undertaker's near quarter-century winning streak came to an end. The Old Guard were finally making way, it seemed. Unfortunately, John Cena didn't get the memo, because when the time came for his match with Bray, he ended up beating the up-and-comer, something which kneecapped his progress for a long time afterwards. Now, the feud did continue after that, but it did little to help Wyatt. He got a win the next month in a steel cage match at Extreme Rules, but this was done with the help of a John Cena fan turned demonic child, which many found to be too hokey. A month later, and the program ended altogether with the champ literally burying Bray under multiple equipment cases to win the rubber match. Yes, what should have been the breakthrough moment for the Eater of Worlds ended up doing more to harm him than anything else, as his aura was damaged, and he fell back down to the upper mid-card as a result. Now in rebuilding mode, Wyatt began a feud with Chris Jericho in the summer of 2014, where he beat Y2J twice, rehabbing himself somewhat in the audience's eyes. After that, he announced he was letting his minions, Harper and Rowan, free, and would be continuing on as a solo act from then on in. From there, he went on to feud with Dean Ambrose in the winter of that year, but with his family now having disappeared, he felt like far less of a threat than he had before. The feud was also hamstrung by some silly moments, like when a hologram appeared during a Hell in a Cell match, or when an exploding TV cost Ambrose the win in one bout. Wyatt was undoubtedly a creative guy, one of the most creative on the roster in fact, but it felt increasingly like it was all becoming a bit too cartoonish, and lacked any of the subtle menace it had in its earlier days. Still, there was renewed hope when, following the 2015 Royal Rumble, Bray began cutting promos on The Undertaker, claiming that his loss to Brock Lesnar the year before had made Wyatt the new face of fear in the company. The idea that Taker might be passing the torch of supernatural gimmick over to Wyatt at WrestleMania 31 excited many fans, and it was also a testament to Bray that he managed to handle the entire build to the match solo, as Taker was being kept off TV so that he could have the big re-debut when the time finally came. Unfortunately though, when the match did come, it didn't live up to the expectations of many. The Eater of Worlds was dealing with an ankle injury that night, and this, combined with The Undertaker's slower pace at that point in his career, ended up once again do the job for the bigger star. It was rumored that at this point Vince McMahon saw Bray as being bulletproof, and that he could lose consistently and it wouldn't hurt him. Fans, however, did not see things the same way, and his continued high-profile losses and inability to get any big-time wins led to some mockingly labeling him as the Eater of Pins around about this time. In an attempt to rectify these growing complaints then, WWE reunited the Wyatt family in mid-2015, now adding a fourth member in the form of Braun Strowman too. 
And with this renewed focus, Wyatt started a program with Roman Reigns, playing with the thoughts of many fans at that time that felt that he did not deserve to be the top dog in the company, and that anyone but him should have that spot. Initially, it looked like this was going to be a turning point for the cult leader, as he got a win over Reigns at July 19th's Battleground. However, after this, the feud continued on for a few months, with Roman almost always getting the upper hand from there on in. He tried to bounce back after this by reigniting his beef with The Undertaker, but this only led to him and his stablemate Luke Harper getting beaten by the Brothers of Destruction at that November Survivor Series. Following this, there were initial plans to pair Bray up with Brock Lesnar for next year's WrestleMania, but those were eventually scrapped, and now the man who had looked set to conquer the wrestling world just two years prior was left without anything to do going into the biggest show of the year. Now, it should be said that he did end up making an appearance at WrestleMania 32, but it was far below where he should have been placed. The Wyatt family came out to interrupt a promo from The Rock, and this led to the whole group getting made to look like jobbers as the Great One sent them packing after pinning Eric Rowan in an impromptu six-second match. And following that embarrassment, it would take him some time to recover, as he spent most of 2016 middling around the upper mid-card with little of note to do. It wasn't until he began a feud with Randy Orton in the autumn, in fact, that things finally showed signs of getting better. This feud saw him actually get multiple wins over the Viper, and eventually led to Randy joining the Wyatt family for a time, creating an interesting situation at the start of 2017 when Orton won the Royal Rumble in January, and Bray was able to survive the Elimination Chamber in February to bag the WWE title for the first time. Initially, the challenger had pledged allegiance to his leader and claimed that he would not face him at WrestleMania. However, to the surprise of no one, this turned out to be a ruse when Orton ended up setting fire to both the Wyatt family compound and the grave of Sister Abigail, Bray's mysterious otherworldly mentor in the lead-up. From there, the two had a match at Mania 33, which died as soon as some images of worms and other bugs began being projected into the ring, something which was supposed to be scary, but just came across as comical. To make matters worse, this was the night that also saw Wyatt lose his newly won gold after only 49 days. And it only went downhill from there, as the next month the two met once again in a House of Horrors match, something that ended up being a precursor of sorts to WWE's modern cinematic matches, but without any of the creativity or excitement that many of those have shown. Yes, it was another bad period for a man who couldn't seem to catch a break. He had it all in terms of his mind, of course, but any ideas he had always ended up coming to nothing, and his booking consistently saw him looking like a loser by the end of things. By this point, in fact, many fans had already given up on Bray, seeing him as someone who was destined to remain a joke no matter what he did. Following the Orton program, he had a brief feud with Woken Matt Hardy, which disappointed most. Then, from there, he was relegated to the tag team division, teaming up with Hardy as the two became known as the Deleters of Worlds. Things got even worse when Matt Hardy went out with an injury in the summer of 2018, and Bray now found himself without a partner and was taken off of TV for almost a year. It was during this time off that he got to thinking. He knew his career was on the verge of being beyond recovery, and he understood too well that if he wanted to save it, he would have to come up with something big. Luckily for him then that Bray was still one of the best creative minds in the industry, and in those months where he was sitting at home, he began to work on his latest creation, The Fiend. It was in April of 2019 that fans got their first taste of this new incarnation. Before he let them in on The Fiend, though, Wyatt began appearing in pre-recorded segments called the Firefly Funhouse. These took the form of a Pee Wee's Playhouse-style children's show, where Bray would have a number of puppet friends he would converse with, including the likes of Mercy the Buzzard, Huskus the Pig Boy, Ramblin' Rabbit, and Abby the Witch. Of course, in typical Bray Wyatt fashion, the whole thing had a very sinister undertone to it, with the most similar thing we can describe it to being the web show, Don't Hug Me, I'm Scared. Fans immediately took to this, and it was heralded as a genius rebirth of the Bray Wyatt character, as during the various episodes of his new show, Wyatt vowed never to return to his failed cult leader and dropped numerous Easter eggs and hints towards his past and his future, which eagle-eyed fans began speculating about online. An example of this would be how his puppet co-hosts were all references to different parts of his career, with Mercy being a reference to Waylon Mercy, Huskis being a nod to his early days as Husky Harris, Ramblin' Rabbit seemingly acknowledging what many fans had criticized him for with his long rambling promos, and Abby the Witch echoing Sister Abigail, 
the still as yet unseen master of the whole thing. And as the weeks went on, the vignettes continued to air, adding more and more layers to the mythology behind Bray each time. After a while, he started talking about another force, one seemingly made up of all the evil within him who he had managed to subdue in order to become the children's TV host. That dark side of his would not be able to be held down forever though, and Wyatt would often end these segments by telling audiences that they were going to have to let him in sooner or later. It did take a few months, but eventually fans were treated to their first glimpse of this demonic presence when he made a quick appearance at the end of an episode of Firefly Funhouse in the summer of 2019. It was only a brief look at this point, but already fans were taken aback by the design of this character, which looked genuinely horrifying, with a mask designed by legendary makeup artist Tom Savini pulled straight from your nightmares. From there, the tension continued to build until the July 15th episode of Raw when, while Finn Balor was celebrating a win, the lights went out and the Fiend broke out of the Firefly Funhouse for the first time, laying waste to the Irishman as a sickening shrieking sound was heard over the loudspeakers. This was awesome. There's no other way to describe it. It was the coolest character WWE fans had seen in years and something completely original, a testament to the mind of Bray Wyatt who had successfully managed to resurrect himself and once again become the most talked about thing in the industry. After the initial attack on Balor, he continued to make surprise appearances, taking out legends like Jerry Lawler and Mick Foley in the weeks that followed. It wasn't until SummerSlam 2019 though where The Fiend had his first official match and on that night, anyone who had been worried that the character might not translate well bell to bell was proved wrong when he hit the ring to an amazing remixed version of his old theme, carrying a lantern made out of the decapitated head of his former self and then proceeded to brutalize Finn so much that he had to retreat back to NXT afterwards. It was a perfect debut, one of the greatest ever, and the entrance alone should be replayed on best of shows for years. Finally, Bray Wyatt had reached his full potential and was set to take over WWE with this amazing new character he had created. Seeing how popular The Fiend was, Vince McMahon soon fast-tracked him to the main event picture, where he would take on Seth Rollins over the Universal title. However, many fans felt this new gimmick shouldn't have been anywhere near the title just yet. Sure, there was a time and place for that, but it could have waited a while longer to build anticipation. Despite this, The Fiend ended up winning Raw's top prize from Rollins, and from there, he stalled as the company struggled to incorporate such an out there character into the world title picture. When he eventually lost the belt in controversial fashion to Bill Goldberg in February of 2020, this sent alarm bells ringing in the ears of many fans who had been through this before. Luckily though, Bray was able to recover this time when he feuded once more with John Cena in the lead up to WrestleMania 36, with the two ending up having one of the most unique matches ever seen that night as they fought inside the Firefly Funhouse. It was less of a traditional bout really and more of a movie scene which saw Wyatt completely dissect Cena's character and end things by sending him packing from the company never to return as of the time of this video's recording. The whole thing was a spectacle that's been compared to a David Lynch movie and really showed what Bray could do when given the ball to run with. From there, he's used the limitations of 2020 to his full advantage as he's unleashed The Fiend in a series of wild cinematic encounters against the likes of Braun Strowman and Randy Orton. Recently, he's even picked up his own Harley Quinn in the form of Alexa Bliss who appears to have been brainwashed by him and now acts as his herald of sorts. As it stands, the last appearance from The Fiend came on December 20th at the Firefly Inferno match where he was set alight by Orton and burnt to a crisp in the middle of the ring. Following the match, he posted some cryptic messages on social media suggesting he's about to metamorphose once more and while he's away, Alexa Bliss continues to keep his flame alive, reminding audiences that he isn't dead yet and that soon they'll have to let him in all over again. What shape this new incarnation takes remains to be seen, but if one thing is for sure, with the mind of Bray Wyatt involved in creating it, it'll be nothing less than spectacular and we can't wait to see it because there are few better in the business today. Well guys, what did you think of the video? Let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, as well as follow WrestleWithAndy on Instagram and Twitter. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.